But the judge noting El Chapo's overwhelming evil, sentencing him to life plus 30 years. Guzman ordered to pay $12.6 billion in restitution. The arrest of Ovidio Guzman sending shockwaves through the state of Sinaloa and its capital city, now under siege by drug cartels. Eyewitnesses report. So the guy I was talking to on the phone once sent El Chapo $227 million in a single year, payment for dope. Now, that's what he testified to in court, which matched the government's existing evidence. But what made the conversation so loco was how normal he seemed and how these crazy events just rolled off his tongue like it was no big deal. Who was I talking to? Peter, a.k.a. Pedro Flores, one half of the infamous Chicago twins that served bricks for Chapo and then served El Chapo up to the feds when they decided to get out of the dope game. I actually came in contact with the twins in 2004. Because they took it, the dudes that robbed them took it to Jay from Flores. He immediately, when he realized that the main diamonds, they took it to him because he would be the guy that could pay for it. A quick digression on the 50 cent spinner chain, 50 cent to master of marketing. It's definitely a total lie that the Flores twins got 50 cents stolen spinner chain back back in the day in Chicago. Probably they were looking to up the profile of the Flores twins, make them cool and urban, aka black America, to add viewers. So they had to get an urban story, so they made that up. So the Flores twins were not in the clutches of the American government with no bail facing life, no parole when they decided to turn state's evidence. Uh, they had worked their way up the food chain for some years, sending literally several billion dollars in cash, at least 800 million of it to El Chapo himself. They lived in one of El Chapo's properties when they were uh, on the run in America for a time. They socialized with them, but they knew they had life terms probably waiting for them. They decided to set up El Chapo. They went to Radio Shack and bought a little recorder. I mean, I think one of them was wanted, but they weren't in custody and recorded El Chapo. I'm talking about H. And they went to the DEA with that. Dude. <laughs> Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, Mexico's most notorious drug lord, convicted by a federal jury. And remember this, all you local lieutenants and junior generals out there in the dope game, the big fellas on top are very Machiavellian. Only loyalty is to themselves. Some people say you're not a real gangster if you never worked with the government. I mean, the most large-scale criminal activity is not possible without police and government involvement. Mexican cartel system, the secret of it is there is no system. That it, it's kind of like the mayor of Medellin, Colombia said, if you shoot them all down, one will take their place. It, it's who's the flavor of the month? Whatever uh, we need, uh, again, we go back to the piece I wrote, uh, the media, media shills, we need a villain, like any movie, but the villain is important for media, New York Times, anybody, because that's what sells. Yeah, yeah, we got El Chapo. Who took El Chapo's place? El Gopo. You know, it doesn't matter. It, it's all bullshit. That's the whole thing. It doesn't matter. When the plane carrying El Chapo touched down in New York two years ago, the world's most wanted narco looked confused, overwhelmed even, asking the DEA agent, where am I? Nueva York, they told him face says it all. The most powerful drug lord ever to live reduced to tears in the hands of U.S. federal agents. Well, Chapo is just one of them. The ones that are really fantastic to me are the ones who never get out there, who never hear of. Informants, people turning against their former colleagues in cases is uh, the lifeblood prosecution of drug dealers. If the Flores twins are a textbook example 
They're a textbook example of everything that goes wrong and what's wrong with that idea. Robbie, the Flores brothers are Chicago's most notorious twins, raking in millions as El Chapo's emissaries here before they flipped on the boss and took him down. Tonight, new court records reveal that their joint account amounted to cash deposited under the floorboards of a house, more than $5 million in cash that their wives are now accused of pilfering. Fresh our memory as to what the Flores twins did exactly. 08, they, they turn a deal, and by 09, they're working, and their father, Margarito Sr., he's like, I mean, I, what the son expressed to me, and now thinking, I didn't want to hammer him too hard about his feelings about his father driving his truck over the border to Sinaloa, but he had to know he was going to death was his allegiance to his own name, even in death in the underworld, like he's going to go sacrifice himself, because a note was left in his car about his sons are ratting, and he was, he was T-O-R-T-U-R-E-D, and son, I mean, he didn't seem happy about it, but he wasn't in tears, I mean, they've been through a lot of intense experiences even before the, uh, what, 12 years they served in prison, and they're going through another intense experience. Now their wives just got convicted of money laundering. They're probably going to have to do a little bit of federal time. It was the Flores' wives who turned to crime, trying to snooker federal prosecutors. But the wives of the cartel, as they proudly branded themselves in print and on TV, didn't get away with the global vacations, shopping sprees, private schools, a J-Lo concert, and other wealthy amenities. There's a lot of evidence there. Um, it looks like the feds had a strong case. It's a sensible thing for them to reach a deal. All during the time the twins were locked up, probably because they were given more information, the feds weren't on them too hard. But right when they went to get out, suddenly it comes out that, oh, well, the wives have been flying to Dubai to see concerts and buying all these expensive clothes. Millions of dollars were being delivered to them. Evidently, they're used to getting their way. I you know, it, it was a bold operation and it lasted a long time and achieved great success and generated millions upon millions in revenue. But uh, obviously it ultimately came to an end, but a pretty, pretty fearless crew willing to take a lot of risks. They do themselves no favors though, by claiming a, a, an attachment to the cartel. And of course they were being watched. The Flores twins, older brother, Armando, maybe his name was, just had to plead guilty he delivered, I think, a couple million and some old furniture or oversaw it. I'm not the type of guy to take a picture with the celebrity. Like, I don't, I don't want a picture. I just want to shake your hand, that's it. So, never asked them for nothing. I would see them at nightclubs. They would buy me a bottle here and there, you know, say what's up. You know, they were the only ones that were actually riding around in Bentleys in the neighborhood. So, it, it, you knew who they were. Did, did you, everyone start to get the impression, okay, these guys are even yet a, another step up the food chain from someone like Cato. Oh yeah, this they, they those, those if you want to be somebody, you want to be them. Were they targets? Did they did they conduct themselves in a manner they should have been? I I think that um, when you're that up in the food chain, man, I think that you're supposed to carry yourself in a whole like I call it being a ninja in the shadows. Um, if, if it would have been me in those shoes, I would have been riding around in an old ass Nissan with regular clothes on and, and just, you know. But that's no fun. It's not, but it's safe. I mean, we see it from, we see it from all the stories, American Gangster. We, we, see, we see all the stories that's always, I mean, even Scarface, the woman, the possessed, like it, it always leads to that. But I think it's in our... That's the whole point of doing it, especially when you're young. Yeah, it's, it's in our genes to like want to shine. So I, I, don't, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's the devil, man. Like, it's, it's, it's crazy. You were well aware that your husbands were involved in the cartel. Yes. How did you we, feel about that? I mean, at the time, you know, you're living that life and you're blinded by pretty much everything. What you see on TV when you see the Kardashians, that's the type of lifestyle that we lived. You have so many people now today on social media that glamorizes that lifestyle and I think that they don't realize what this life is about. It's about destruction. It's about violence. People are getting killed. Okay, so there came a time 
uh, when a very serious drug war went on between Sinaloa and Beltran Leifat cartels down in Mexico, and it was over who was going to service the largest drug customers in the U.S., which the, the Flores twins were at the top of the list. Yeah. And this was near the end of your time with the Flores brothers, and uh, tell us about, you know, your knowledge of what went on and then how they kind of got you out. Yeah, well, we were trying to create separation. You know, we had a music business that we were still doing together. I had Connected Records and Val had uh, Plugged Entertainment. And we were trying to create separation uh, between what we were doing just because they knew they were headed down a slippery slope. So what ended up happening is, is when they got down there, they really kind of had to choose what side that they were going to really work with. And they really had no need for both uh, cartels. So they chose... Uh, were they being forced to choose? You know, that's all speculative. That I, I, don't, I don't think that it was like that. I think it was more like, you know, pick your poison who, you know, but you're going to roll. You're going to you know. be with both. Right, you're not going to be with both. You know, that's that's clear. I pretty much got put in position and, and they sanctioned uh, an okay. They kind of gave a blessing at the level that they're at. All they really had to say, yo, he's good deal with him he can handle it and they kind of somewhat let me handle uh, a summer lower level clients of theirs and uh who did they put you with um albino quintero was uh cousins with caro quintero which he was kind of the oh yeah. the uh one of the main Heart lieutenants attacks. you know there was other underlings under an old man caro quintero oh uh, yeah Nowhere left to hide for one of the FBI's most wanted drug lords. Not even the mountains of his native Sinaloa state in Mexico. Rafael Caro Quintero. So his cousin was kind of like running the show. And, you know, there's a few phone conversations here and there uh, between uh, myself and the associates who he sent to represent him here in Chicago because he didn't really come uh, you know here but he he came a few times he was in the studio with us before the twins went on the run you know they had were taking care of both cartels you know but you know they they were in the studio with us you know and hanging with us and so i they knew me a rough from around them so it wasn't hard for them to refer me and say yeah you remember you know cash from the studio he's good you know take care of him and then they sent lieutenants out and people to kind of oversee the whole operation and and kind of hold things down and you know but they gave me free reign to do what i what i needed to do and that's kind of where my reign and run into the drug trade really started to happen at you know prior to that i was really like a lieutenant for the Flores brothers run an air, and run an air, you know and and a lieutenant to cato before he died do you feel badly that your husbands were involved in this and you knew all about it? Yes. I mean, I wish I could sit here and, and take it back, but I mean, this is this is a part of who we are. They've written a book, Cartel Wives, which gives an inside look at how the $2 billion illicit empire operated. She was definitely very attracted to money, but we all get trained to worship money. And right now in this culture, get the bag at all costs, get the money, run it up to fuck it up. For what? Rudy King Cato Rangel is a story that ties together a lot of this stuff, especially on the Chicago side with the Flores brothers. And it also gives you a sense of the amount of violence that when you're generating, well, the Flores twins sent several billion dollars themselves to uh, uh, south of the border, the kind of violence that is all around, whether it's your responsibility directly or not. Rudy Rangel was the second or third husband of Valerie, one of the uh, cartel wives who recently pled guilty to money laundering while their husbands were in witness protection. And uh, she was married to King Cato when he was executed in a barber shop in Chicago. 
in uh, just a few months after his execution, which caused a lot of uproar in the city of Chicago as he was not only a budding um, uh, music mogul, he was working with Damien Cash on De Niro Records. He was one of the uh, Hispanic uh, organization leaders that had a lot of social and perhaps business ties to the uh, black gangs and a black gang, specifically a guy that the feds and the city of Chicago has seen to head on their radar to get for a long time was Blaine, uh, LaBar Broman Span. Go, go to jail and lie. You know, everybody they get, everybody they arrest, the first thing they saying, bro man, bro man, bro man, bro man. Bro man, bro man, so that makes you lie. Because if you, anybody, anywhere you go, all you gotta do is mention my name and, and you know, you get likes and all this type of thing. They refer to him as a four corner hustler, but he said he has that crossed out on his tattoo and has the word outlaw written uh, I'm not sure. There's a lot of this outlaw stuff in Chicago. I don't know enough about exactly what that means to go too much into detail, but the government considered LaBar Span a four corner hustler. Four corner hustlers, heavy on the west side, heavy in the area where there's a lot of drug activity. Right now, at least three open air drug markets shut down after a federal trafficking probe. The U.S. Attorney's Office today announced federal charges against 10 members or associates of the Four Corner Hustlers Street Gang. During the investigation, they say they seized fentanyl laced, uh, fentanyl laced heroin, rifles, even a MAC-10 submachine gun. The LaBar Span uh, case, very complicated and interesting. I just interviewed him from his prison cell. He's awaiting sentencing on like four murders and extortion. He beat a few of the murders though, so look out for that interview. But LaBar Span was immediately put on trial for killing uh, King Cato for setting it up. Uh, Mr. Span is in a wheelchair, but supposedly he's a guy that can orchestrate these sorts of things, again, according to the government. No, when I beat the Cato case, I end up standing at extra yet. Oh, for what, something, or oh, a jail charge? No, I had the jailhouse case, plus I had an armed robbery. Cato got killed in 03, right? Yeah. And you got arrested for that a few months later? Exactly, and I got acquitted. But he was found not guilty in Chicago State Court. Uh, but then they held him, put some other charges on him. The feds ended up bringing that back as one of his murders, which to me seems like double jeopardy. He thinks he's going to get it thrown out. So he's currently convicted of the King Cato Rangel murder. But uh, as he points out, uh, well, they said he was uh, paid to do it by the Flores twins because supposedly Rangel owed, he had stolen 300 kilos or something from the Flores twins. But in the case, there's no testimony of anyone saying the Flores twins met with LaBar Span at what time, what money was paid. Tell us what they said the case was in 03 with Cato and why you beat it. See, the whole thing with the Cato murder, they said that we was paid to kill Cato. First, they didn't know. First, they say we was robbed. Then they say we was paid by the Flores twin to kill Cato. When the whole time, it was to do with my chief's nuttery, who... Rio, we end up winning a why, talking to Mark T's notary, and he mentioned something about one of my little homies' name, and said something about we supposed to have something to do with uh, killing Cato for some money. And that's how the Cato murder came about, saying that uh, I, I, he said he supposed to got paid for killing Cato, but he claimed to me, and I let him use one of my shooters to kill Cato. Remember, the Flores twins cut that deal, and here's the thing with deals. You have to tell them every, it's called queen for a day. You have to tell them everything you did so it can all be written into the deal. Now, what does this mean? Well, for example, there was a, uh, my boss in New England, Frank, Frank Cadillac Salemi, and he cut a deal some years back, went into witness protection. You know, he confessed to a bunch of murders and he was living out normally. He was like 88, 89 years old. He was in witness protection old murder they dug up like the, 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 the skeleton of, of a guy that him and his son had supposedly killed and buried under this nightclub back in the 80s in Boston and he hadn't told him about it 
plucked him out of witness protection, and he's back, or unless he just died, but they put him back in federal prison out of witness protection. So the Flores twins would have would have been playing with fire if they had hired Labar Span and they didn't uh, tell about it. And why wouldn't they have? Because Labar Span is a very, for whatever reason, I mean, he's a target that the, the powers of being Chicago really want to get. Like I said, they put him on trial for King Cato in uh, 03. He beat it and they brought it back up. Uh, just a few years back in this where it culminated with his conviction just maybe six months ago and as LeBar Span pointed out it was Valerie that was married to Cato at the time and street rumor is that he was gunned down because of unpaid debts to the Flores twins I don't know is that true they could just be street talk in a not long after his death she went and married Peter Flores and prior to Cato, she had been with a uh, either a Satan disciple or maniac Latin disciple, maniac Latin disciple, a guy named Oso, who was a big dealer, and he got shot up, and she left him and went with Cato. So, but I got to the Flores twins, man. They told everybody but their mama, man. And for them not to educate me and stuff, if they knew me, man, they would have said it, man. You be they told on look at they told on chapel. Yeah, well, fact. Yeah, that's for sure. And did you ever, did you remember seeing Cato around ever? Or? No, but I remember his wife, you know, his wife fucked with one of the twins. Stay married. Stay married. So, yeah, you feel me? So she, she probably was up with the shit. She, ba she about to go to, uh, she about to go to the fans. They both got convicted of money laundering like three weeks ago. Right, so she, she probably got them in has something to do with the man getting killed. Nine times out of ten, she did. And we're going to let JC from Wrong to Strong, who grew up with all of them, tell us a little bit more. But strange, the bar span's convicted for it. But what role did the Flores twins or one of their wives really have or not have in this integral piece of the Flores twins' story? Me and Cato start hanging out more. He was on a whole higher level, you know. Um, for him to even mess mess with you, he was doing you a favor, you know what I mean? Okay. So he was married to Valerie. I knew Valerie since my teenage years. Valerie I mean, was the daughter of a Chicago cop? Yes. So, you know, Valerie. What was she like? Valerie was like my, my, my older sister as a kid like growing a up, from man. The very smart, man. Business sassy, beautiful. just beautiful. Oh, she was smart. So she kind of was probably helping kids. She, she, she was married to all the big dogs or yeah. dated the major players in Chicago, like even as a teenage girl. You know, she was with also from the same disciples. He was a big hustler. Then she married uh, Baby D from the same disciples. Oh, she was married before Cato? Oh, yeah. Oh, she was, was she older than Kate? No, no, she was like my So age. this daughter of a Chicago police officer was married to like an equivalent of Cato before Cato, then Cato, and then she went on to marry one of the Florida brothers. Yeah. So she kept trading up in the dope game. Well, she, she was, uh, she was sought out by a lot of people that, you know, um, she was beautiful, man. I mean, she was Plus, she was beautiful. the business. Beautiful, smart, she was a hustler. You think her father was, was shady or you have no idea? Nah, her father was a straight, straight square, man. I, I know who her father is. What does he think about everything? That I happened? mean, can you really control what your kids do, man? You Jesus. know, you know, it is what it is. It's like I tell people sometimes, you know, you could come from a, a, a straight lawyer, preacher, whatever family. And if you like trouble, you like trouble. It's, I mean, there's, there's no way around it. You can't control how your kids are, are going to turn out. And and Valerie was always a hustler. I mean, Valerie's the one that taught me the hustle game. Valerie, I remember the first time I got the ten thousand dollars. I went and I bought some Dickies and like some gym shoes. And she's like, Oh no 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 no. She's like, You can't dress like that no more. And I was like, and what she do you was mean? A, she was a teenager. Yeah, she was, I was like, what do you mean? She's oh, so like, you no. you guys were close. Yes, yeah, yeah. She's like, uh, I'm going to take you shopping. And we went shopping and I bought lacrosse, you know, gym shoes, lacrosse, you know, shirts, uh, 
I always, I, I started making fun of it because I was like, you're dressing me like a fucking golf player. And she's like, no, you look like a gangster now. She made me, she picked out my chain with my medallion. And she's like, now, now you can tell these bitches to sweat you. She picked out my car. Wow. Like she, she, she built me. She, she made me. She man. must have grew up a few blocks from you, or. I mean, she at the time she was dating a, a, a close acquaintance of mine, you know, from the same disciples, and she always had a liking for me. She always, you know, she always, she always looked out for me. She took, she took care of me too when I was in prison in Mexico. She would send me money and letters. Ooh, so um, you guys are very close. You know, um, when she was actually living in Mexico. She with, wasn't with Cato when. You got locked up in in, in Mexico. No, 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 no. She was. So with, you met with, you actually her your relationship with her predates. Oh, since her teenagers. Okay. Yeah, since teenagers. Um. Uh. The last time I heard from her is when she went to Mexico and she was living out there. And well, me and him just got closer because he was with Valerie, and ah. Valerie was like, "Come over to the house. Come over to the house. Hang out with us. Blah blah blah." So I would go hang out with them at their house every morning, smoke some weed, you know, bullshit. Cato knew how much Valerie loved me, you know, how much she always wanted me to do good. I'll always love you, Kenny. Love you, Kenny. So the twin I spoke with and Valerie, who I spoke with, talked about them not wanting their children to love money like they were taught to. And of course, Valerie is the son of a, uh, a daughter of a Chicago police officer. And so was the other uh, Flores twin wife. And of course, Valerie had been with the big Satan disciple. Then she was with King Cato. And then she was with, I think it's Pedro, Peter. No había otro camino como juntarla. Es exclusivo para la señorita Kay del Castillo y el señor Sean Penn. Their father, you know, feel like he really loved them because he chose the game over them and they chose themselves over him. And when you go all the way down the food chain of drugs, I mean, the choice of choosing yourself, getting high off of the drug or the money or the narcissism over your social responsibility to your children, to your family, to those around you, to your criminal compatriots, to your country, it goes through every level. And worshiping money is narcissism, it's the opposite of love. The money can't buy you love. Surviving El Chapo, the way they did it, the Flores twins did it, was telling on them. Key justification in their mind, and probably a real justification is, they showed a lot of love to the streets. And I know this is true because again, I was with people in Chicago, dangerous, dangerous people who said, nobody better come up to me calling, talking bad about the Flores twins cause I'll, cause they helped, they made a lot of people, a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars. Same reason Alpo could go back home. Maybe some people didn't like them, but it's a lot of people he didn't tell on. Just like in the movie, Peyton Foley said, I'll only tell on people in DC so I can show my face in Harlem again. It's exactly what happened. We still don't know why he got killed, but the Flores twins for all the love they showed in the street, now they're out. And I don't think, at least on the American side, I don't get the feeling, now there might be cartel assassins looking for them, but I don't think any on the American side in the, in the streets, they seem okay. You see the case for what it is. You see the, the holes in the case and how the was brought to your doorstep. And you realize- okay, You're speaking from their perspective. From their perspective or anybody that has a case. You know, there's always a case that started by someone setting you up and then that guy's not even in your case. So, you know, then the people who are in the case and left with the on their stoop are sitting there trying to sort it out to try to lower, lower the impact of the situation. Constantly being kidnapped, followed to be Constantly, kidnapped. Like you know, I know they're kidnapped. You know, one moment. of the brothers was kidnapped. You were around at the Yeah, I was around and- Tell us about uh, kidnapping and like- I mean, it's it's what, it's the what, same it it's the, the same shit as you see in the movies, except there's no fucking feds in the negotiations. It's a dark conversation. Someone's calling you, telling you, yo, this 
motherfucker's gonna die. I've been kidnapped and, myself. Oh, you, you know what I'm saying? So, um, and, and those people mean you know, they'll kill you. Yeah. So I mean, you know, they. Uh, What's the? Why, how do you know they're not gonna get the stuff and not kill it? You don't. Yeah, you don't. It's just a matter of how far they're willing to prove who they are and their point, and if they feel like you're a threat to Afterwards. come back to them afterwards as to whether you survive or live or not, you know? Or if the money's dropped off. And sometimes the money gets dropped off and they kill you anyway, just because they're, you know- Wanna kill somebody. Yeah, they wanna kill somebody. So, but at the level that they're at, everyone's an enemy, everyone's looking to rob you, everyone's f***ing up drugs, not paying you giving you a story about the feds came in and kicked my door in. Oh, not just the kidnappings, but the fake raids where, okay, I get a hundred keys or whatever. Let's just say I get a hundred keys from you, so I owe you $1.8 million. I get six people to dress up in FBI and DEA windbreakers, kick my door in, ransack the house, cuff me up, take me out to an unmarked car and drive me off. Then I create fake arrest paperwork, right? So that I can show you the paperwork. Plus, if you send your people around on the block to like knock on neighbor's doors or just ask around, I might even have some unwitting, I might have a few people in the circle in the house with me when the fake raid happens. Uh, so if I'm asking around and like, oh no, the FBI did hit the house and they took the stuff out. But there was no raid, it's a fake raid. So I can say the dope got took, cause that's usually the rule. Like if the, if the police take the dope, you ain't gotta pay or I ain't gotta pay all. So people that love money like that, they don't love human beings. Creating fake paperwork, creating fake, oh, uh, fake. fake teams to come in and raid you. Uh, oh, so that someone can say, yeah, I saw it. Oh, you wow. know, so. Wait so, a second, go, hold on, hold on. <laughs> so you know of instances where people had stuff on consignment yeah. and they created, they yeah, had they, they their staged, buddies dress yeah, up. They staged it, they staged it, took pictures, called, hey man, they're raiding them right now, right now. this, that, and the other, you know, so. Wow. When you talk about who was thrown under the bus, I can guarantee you that any person that they did throw under the bus was a motherfucker that was no good to them to begin with and backstabbed them at one point or other, owed them money or, or was unloyal or unfaithful, you know, cause in this game, you know, these guys jump plugs and go from one guy to another, like they're changing underwear. When yeah, you don't what, when you don't have it, they're gonna go run to the other guy at the opposite spectrum and the other gang and go get work from them. And then when you get it, now they're 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 robbing Peter to pay Paul. They pay you with their money. They pay them with your money, and things come up missing. And they're pancaking debt. And before you know it, the truth comes out. But so people and now some regular for you know even street people that are watching this and think well. Okay, if people are owing, why are you giving them more stuff? But at that level, there's only so many people you can give 50 kilos to. Oh yeah, I mean- It's not like a, you can go replace them. The people at our level and the, that played ball on our level are unicorns in the city. What I really wanna just like say is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a classic Tony Montana line. I didn't fuck anybody who didn't have it coming to them already. That's just, you know, this is movie shit, but it's reality. Like, we lived it. Like, that movie's fabricated. It's maybe based on lightly on somebody's life, but, you know, movies are fabricated. The shit you see in movies, I've lived through it. I've experienced it, and it's, it's surreal to still be here, even in my situation with an ankle monitor on and, you know, talking to you and, and, and telling my journey and my story and trying to clarify things. And when the feds roll up a big drug operation, it's not all about just getting the person above, it's about getting the whole organization. So the Flores twins, during the time they were working, they went through their Rolodex, and all these guys, mostly black dealers from around the Midwest, because those are black population centers, Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, Cincinnati, Pennsylvania, 
They were calling guys up who had tried to kidnap them before or had kidnapped them, who owed them money, big money. We fronted you for, you know, we, they might have sold these guys, you know, 40, 50 bricks a month for a couple of years. And then on the last bag, they didn't pay them, which is a common thing in dope. Whether you're dealing with a crackhead who's coming and getting nickels, you're selling ounces, you're selling pounds, you're selling bricks. The last sack, they don't want to pay. So you kind of chalk that up. So the people they set up were people they that did bad things to them in their mind. Uh, the other story was Damien Cash was, I don't learn many things at this point, but like two stories from Chicago, I learned one from the son of a Chicago black gangster who told me the story of his uncle fairly recently doing something for some people south of the border and went to last 50 brick bag, he didn't, he was planning on not paying and figured he'd just hide and what are they gonna do? They gonna come up to the south side of Chicago and make him pay? Well, they did, they showed up and they grabbed him and they took him around the family member's house, shook every tree. I guess they must've scared people to death and they paid for those 50 keys. And then guess what? They dropped another bag of 50 on him and said, you're still working and you, we, you gotta sell 50 a month. Because at that level, there's not that many people that can move that kind of weight. So they don't just let you go away. Because it's hard to replace a 50 key salesman. And if you're selling 50 keys for them, well, man, that person up the chain, they might be responsible for 300 keys a month. So they need all their 50 brick a, key, uh, a month guys. People that love money like that, they don't love human beings. And um, to go back to the start, Again, I don't want to say anything inappropriate, but it's whenever I'm interacting with um, all these young people I know that have these big drug dealer, former drug dealer fathers, I just wonder what their conflicted feelings must really be, and they can't really say them out loud. They may not even have worked through what they are because Pedro Flores seemed to still be working through it and processing it as I was talking to him. I don't know what he really thought about his father. I don't think, they definitely didn't get the love. They felt, well, he didn't, they didn't feel. He chose the game over his children. And anytime you don't tell and you go to prison, you chose your reputation in the street, you chose your ability to continue to earn in the criminal landscape, and you chose your drug dealing friends over your children and your wife or whatever you got going on. That is a fact. So that's why you shouldn't get involved in crime, kids, because you're going to be forced to make decisions with no good answer. Money does not buy love, but it does buy you enmity. And the more money you might get with somebody, the less they might love you, because the more they love the money and the more willing to put you in the ground or put you underground, in the Florence ADX, Al Prophet, American Dope, surviving Al Chapo. The man who ordered the torture and murder of his enemies, then blowing a kiss to his wife just before leaving the courtroom.